Uh, I think in many ways this is probably the most important topic and the most important subject uh, that we've covered uh, throughout the year in the lunchtime expeditions. I mean, some have gotten more press and some have more emotions attached to it uh, on the front end, like the wolf, uh, wolf issues and some of the others. But uh, what's happening with our forest is such a, such a, a, a broad-based um, and pervasive uh, uh, action that, uh, that I think this is, uh, this is probably one of those that has more global significance as well as local significance of, of anything that we've had before in there. Um, today's presentation, let's get right to it, of course, on whitebark pine, but more broadly on, on western forests. And I really can't think of a, a better person to do this. Initially, I think many of you know that uh, Jamie Westerholt from American Forests had planned to come up from, uh, from Colorado uh, and talk. And uh, she had uh, another engagement that uh, came up, a uh, commitment. And uh, we are really, really lucky to have this guy uh, today because he's been in the heart of this and probably one of the most knowledgeable people about western forests uh, that we could possibly get, and especially the issues now. He's been, he served on the first grizzly bear coordinating committee um, that, uh, and that's where I first uh, began reading some of his publications, and I've been following his work for, for a long time. He also has served on the Greater Yellowstone uh, Coordinating Committee, uh, dealing with the subject at, at hand today. Uh, he is a supervisory resource management biologist with the Yellowstone National Park, uh, and as I say, truly one of the most knowledgeable people about what he's going to speak about today uh, that uh, we'll ever find. So uh, please welcome Dan Reinhardt. Sorry. I'll go ahead and try to stand behind here and if I get a little uncomfortable or they'd give me a box, I'll uh, move off to the side. So anyway, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. And, uh, you know, I guess what I would like to do is talk to you guys about the ecology and management of white bark pine. And uh, again, my experience mostly is in the greater Yellowstone area. I've been, uh, you know, studying white bark pine for quite a bit, bit of years. More recently, I'm more into the management of white bark pine. And before that, I guess American Forest is the one who asked me to come and give this presentation. I will give a little proviso that I'm here representing the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee, white bark pine subcommittee. Yellowstone National Park. I'm not really representing American Forest, but we are initiating a pretty exciting partnership with American Forest. They really sort of uh, taken on this issue of white bark pine and white bark pine decline, and I think that's a really good thing. So I think we're going to start off the video, and I'm not sure exactly. Bonnie, you may need to help me from American Forest, and then I, what I would like to do then is just give a presentation on white bark pine in the greater Yellowstone area. So. This is probably one of the few places where you actually have white bark along a road system outside of wilderness or wilderness study area. We're looking for seedlings. And then I got that spruce. You see the cones on those? One beautiful tree, and you're girdling these trees all around it. White bark pine is a special species because it is a keystone species. It is interrelated with many other species that are dependent upon that tree. White bark pine are super important because they help the snow to accumulate under the trees and then they also help the snow to melt more slowly because they create shade. And so we're able to actually have water in our rivers year round. They take carbon out of the air and create these pine nuts that are super high in protein and fat. And so many forest animals really, really love those seeds. White bark pine is under threat by an unprecedented outbreak of pine bark beetles and also a disease called blister rust. What we really care about is preparing the site so that these white bark stands are much more able to withstand the threats that they're facing. We do consider white bark pine a species in peril in the greater Yellowstone area and really throughout its range there are really two agents that are causing white bark pine decline right now. 
The first is a non-native pathogen called white pine blister rust. This pathogen sort of hits the trees and it slowly kills it one limb at a time. Well, it's like the flu. The tree will keep getting infected over and over again throughout its life, and it'll fight it off. It's like we fight the flu off. And then it starts to ooze sap. It's trying to push that rust out. Where's that adult beetle you said you found? Oh. Yep, there's two beetles in here. Very good. The other issue is mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle is a native species. They've evolved together, white bark pine and this uh, disturbance. We're not getting these cold winters that we used to have that really knock them down, that it seems to be more persistent on the landscape. The Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee has put together a pretty comprehensive plan that ranges from finding ways to protect against damage from pine bark beetles, selecting and growing disease-resistant trees, and really looking into the future. We currently know that the rust resistance for white bark pine for the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem out in the natural stands is 28%. When you bring those trees into an orchard, you've not only got improvement on the mom, you've got improvement on the dad, the pollen parent. So by having this orchard, you are doubling your rust resistance. So we'll have a more consistent cone crop in here. We'll be able to uh, water these trees. We'll be able to fertilize them. We will be planting 15 acres of about 5,000 trees that are survivors from that rust screening. What is happening here doesn't happen anywhere else in the United States. To have this cooperative agreement among federal agencies. American Forest is really playing a coordinating role in this process. We're working with the Forest Service, we're working with um, universities, with the Park Service, and with other partners to really bring attention to the scope of this problem and its importance. I came into this thinking that this was going to be an uphill battle. But I think, actually, when I've listened to the people who are on the ground here, the people who are really studying this, they're tremendously optimistic. I am hopeful about white bark pine in the greater Yellowstone area. We're sort of early enough in the game where if we keep initiating these restoration techniques across these boundaries that we do have a, a really good shot of trying to maintain white bark pine through the high elevation landscape. This is a process of discovery. What we're learning about white bark pine are going to provide a host of lessons that are transferable, not just to the Mountain West, but to forest beyond. We can restore this ecosystem, even outside of wilderness areas, in our lifetimes, if we have that planting commitment. So, again, this is a, a new partnership with American Forest. The video I think we just took this summer, I think they're still kind of working on that. But they've actually taken this initiative, and I think they feel pretty good uh, trying to really be partners with it. The people that, you, most of the people that you saw on that video are actually members of the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee, the White Bark Pine Subcommittee, and uh, they're basically managers throughout uh, the Greater Yellowstone area for the, the Park Service, the Forest Service, and, and we've been together for a while and what I want to talk to you guys about is how do we manage an ecosystem in peril you know and, and in decline and I think that uh, we need to know more about white bark pine as we go forward actually towards the management of this species and I just want to check can everybody hear me okay so I like to be maybe away from this podium a little bit so again the greater Yellowstone area consists of the national parks the national forests uh, wildlife refugees Bureau of Land Management, you know, state lands, private lands, it's over 24 million acres. And it is, you know, a, a, a pretty, you know, a pretty intact ecosystem. I think we should be proud of where we live right now as far as the greater Yellowstone area. And I think it shows that we're pretty in a pretty nice area as far as uh, intact ecosystems. Uh, white bark pine, you know, the range of white bark pine is really the northern Rocky Mountains of the, of the United States, also in southern Canada, of course, the Cascade Mountains. And in the greater Yellowstone area, it comprises about 2.5 million acres uh, in, the, in the greater Yellowstone area. It's 
about 10% uh, of the land mass. And again, it's a species of high elevation. This is where you'll find white bark pine. And you know, we do consider white bark pine to be a, a, a keystone upper subalpine species. It's a, it's a dominant tree species. Once you get about 8,000, 8,500, 9,000 feet, that varies uh, you know, throughout the, the ecosystem. It also plays an important role in those communities and you know, in those, in those ecological value on that. It affects nutrient and water cycles. It you know, provides those unique plant communities that we see in that upper elevation area uh, around here. It also, and I think this is what we know a lot, is that it does provide important wildlife habitat and critical forage. Uh, and also, you know, you saw the, in the video that Clark's Nutcracker, they're a very important, uh, play, play a very important role as far as the dispersal of seeds and generation, uh, regeneration of white bark pine. Um, again, white bark pine has, you know, they have these cone crops that they have and it's very erratic. One year you'll get a really good year and then you get a great year and a couple bad years and medium years. It's very uh, sporadic cone crops. But when we do get these cone crops, uh, like we did these past two years, we've had, had some pretty good ones. They produce these these cones that are, and they have these seeds in them. And they're like the, the pinion pine seeds that you buy in the store. They're high in fat, they're high in calories. They're sort of what the doctor ordered for a lot of wildlife species and obviously including the Yellowstone grizzly bear that, that they produce, you know, important forage for. Uh, and then again, the, the, the Clark's Nutcracker. This is sort of a neat story uh, regarding white bark pine. Almost all of the regeneration of white bark pine comes from this animal. The Clark's Nutcracker will go up there and they'll collect all these seeds, they put them in their little sublingual pouch, and then they'll go and cache them throughout the landscape in these little areas. And what's interesting, if you do see like little young white bark pine trees, uh, you'll see them in clumps of five or seven or something like that. Or sometimes if you see these large white bark pine trees, you'll see these multi stalked stems, you know, on those. Those are actually from those Clark Nutcracker caches that produce the seeds. So very good for, for, for both the bird and this tree as, as far as I'm concerned. So white bark pine is declining throughout its range right now. Um, it's, right now it is experiencing a pretty high a rate of decline, maybe more than what we'd see in normal forest dy dynamics. Um, it's, it's a, you know, I consider white bark pine more of a landscape than you know, one individual or two individuals. It's really, that is what we're seeing declining throughout its range of white bark pine. Uh, that white bark pine mortality is variable. Um, in Yellowstone, we're sort of in that 10 to 30% of what we've sort of determined, again, very variable. But if you go to Glacier Park or Western Montana, the Whitefish Range, or any places or in Idaho, that mortality is much, much higher. And really, that's probably even more, uh, uh, you know, re requires us to look into that as far as managers and maybe look and see if we can protect and restore the species upon the landscape. Uh, some of the causal factors of the decline of white bark pine include mountain pine beetle, and again, you heard about this a little bit, you know, on that video. Uh, mountain pine beetle is a native disturbance, as we as we like to call it, just like fire. But there are some things going on. I'll talk about that in a moment as well. White pine blisterus. This is a non-native invasive species, um, and fire management policies. And again, there's some good and bad things going on that. And then really what's going on that we're concerned about is climate change and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So mountain pine beetle, let's talk about that. Uh, mountain pine beetle again is a native species indigenous to the pine forest in the western United States. We had a major epidemic in the 1930s and if you get into the high elevation places and you see these great big, you know, what we call ghost trees, those big silver gray snags are beautiful actually. That a lot of it was from the mortality that happened in the 1930s as well. Uh, it occurs in lodgepole pine and other pine species quite a bit, but more recently it seems to have hit the higher elevation white bark pine, uh, so, it, um, so it, it's sort of been a little more in, 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 uh, in higher elevations. Um, you know, an, an interesting thing about white bark pine, or mountain pine beetle, is if, that was, if those beetles attack a tree, 
the next year, that tree is essentially dead. You know, you see these big, you know, what we call the seas of red, you know, kind of stuff. And Mount, if you look at Avalanche Peak, which is just on the east side of Yellowstone Park, and this was a beautiful white bark pine area, it's really got decimated in the, you know, basically from about 2004 to 2008, really got to hit it hard. And it's really a spectacular way for it to die, is what, it, what a way I think about it. But it is a natural event. It occurs on these stands, especially on the larger trees uh, in, in, its, in some kind of an episodic, uh, you know, manner as well. But this more recent epidemic of white bark pine may have some things, and there is definitely a discussion among the science on this, is are these drought conditions, is potential climate change maybe making this more of an anthropogenetic or, or human-caused event? And those are the kind of things that we're wrestling with as scientists and as managers. And again, just what you can see a little bit uh, on this graph, a more recent epidemic, it's really hit the western forest, and not just white bark pine, but obviously other pine species uh, as well. And if, I'm not sure if you can see this graph on the, on the lower left, but on the monitoring that we've been doing on white bark pine in more recent years, it does show that once you get into those higher, larger diameter trees, 30 centimeters is about, you know, about that big, that's when our mortality has been the highest cause. So really a sort of a big tree type of a, of a case of mortality. Uh, white pine blister rust. You know, white pine blister rust, again, is a uh, invasive species. It came into this country about the turn of the century. Um, these are the type of signs that you find uh, as far as that. You got the fruiting bodies or the acea. You know you got blister rust when you find those. These other type of signs you see, whether it's swelling or roughening the bark, you know, this blister rust, these cankers, those are the kind of things that you see. And it really sort of kills the tree slowly. You know, you'll see it where a, you'll see a flagging a red branch or something like that that's called flagging or you'll see the tops of the tree where it dead also the younger trees you'll see those as well um, and it's also variable across the range of white bark pine as well and again you look in those western areas I think there's more of a climatic thing where you get that maritime climate that's when uh, I think those those spores really propagate from the host species of ribes or our current bush back to the tree Yellowstone has always been a little bit, you know, less susceptible than other areas, but we have uh, blister rust in the, uh, as far as the incidence rates between 20 and 25 percent. I think that's what our monitoring has showed us so far. Uh, again, it's an introduced species, came from Eurasia, probably hit the Vancouver, Seattle area around, 19, around the turn of the last century. Um, it definitely it goes after those five needle pine. So it's white bark pine. The western white pine was a very, uh, you know, important timber species throughout the, the, the west that now isn't because of this blister rust. Limber pine, maybe in areas around here, those you can see this blister rust has affected, you know, in, in, this, in this area. And it's especially fatal it's a you know pathogen, especially is once it gets more developed and gets more. And you, like I said, you go to Western Montana Glacier National Park, you will see a lot more mortality than you would per se through here. But I always say, don't underestimate the incipientness of this white pine blister rust. Uh, again, it did not evolve with the species, you know, and it comes in waves, and something that I'm I I remain you know concerned about. So fire, fire is kind of, you know, like a, like a blind date, a lot of good, maybe some bad things going on with, with that. And, you know, one of the things that have maybe led to the decline of, of, of white bark pine is maybe some of our fire suppression uh, strategies that we've had for the past 100 years. Um, so especially, again, more west of us where actually forest succession, subalpine firs, Engelmann spruce, they sort of encroach upon white bark pine. White bark pine is not a great competitor uh, on that, and I think some of the fire suppression has really sort of led to some of the decline in, in, in white bark pine. But also, we're looking now, well, maybe fire is also bad, and that there are some maybe special genetic areas that we may be looking for protection of white bark pine. And then, 
again, we have climate change. And climate change, the big word that I really associate with climate change and white bark pine is really uncertainty. We really don't know the, how it's going to be manifested. We've had some models that were ran regarding white bark pine and basically sort of creeps up the mountainside until it's gone it's through competition of lower elevation species on that. I think we need more work to sort of help us model what climate change may meet on that. And then also, how are these other pathogens that we talked about, whether it's mountain pine beetle, whether it's blister rust, whether they're working together in some type of synergy or forest succession, how will you know maybe potential climate change scenarios affect those type of agents as well. Those are the type of things that I think we're trying to figure out right now as far as climate change. And also, just want to let you know that last year, 2011, white bark pine was considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service looked at all the data and looked at all the information. They basically came up with the conclusion that it was warranted but precluded. Uh, and we consider that as a land manager for the U.S. Forest Service or for the National Park Service to be a candidate species. Um, and you can sort of read right there what that means on that. Um, I'll you know this as a manager you know in the greater Yellowstone area I kind of like what it's called right there I think what it does is it gives us that opportunity to look at white bark pine to monitor the status of this species and maybe even work towards the management and restoration of this species before it really becomes you know listed under the endangered species act so it does show that um, you know, that the, the data is, 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 is apparent to me and to others that this is a, a species of concern that we need to keep an eye on. So, where can we go from there? You know, there's a lot of things that we can do, again, towards the management of white bark pine. Number one is maybe there are ways that we can protect white bark pine where it does it's, it persist on the landscape. Uh, again, mountain pine beetle protection is one thing that we can do. You can see that little patch. That's a ferrum called verbenone. And there's also a, a, you know, a pesticide called carbaryl that we can use. That will protect those trees from, from mountain pine beetle attacks. Actually, you know, I, I don't think I can you know, protect the Mount Washburn Massive of mountain pine beetle with this kind of a management. But maybe there are specific areas areas where we have genetically unique trees that we may look for protection as well on, on that. Wild and fire management, you know, this is again, this is an important thing. I personally am a big fan of wild and fire. I think that does produce a, a good form of restoration, especially in our wilderness areas. Um, it, it, what it does to me is it presents a, a mosaic on the landscape. And I think that is what we need. We need multiple stands, multiple age classes of white bark pine. Give it that resilience that I think it needs as it goes through the future and looks at the, these other uh, pathogens that we talked about as well. There are silvicultural treatments um, that, such as thinning, planting, some other things like that, prescribed fire possibly. Um, there's planting, I think, that shows some promises as far as uh, dealing with the future of white bark pine as well. But that's how maybe we can protect maybe existing areas of white bark pine. There's also things that we can try to, try to restore white bark pine on the landscape. Uh, there's plus trees. These are trees that we've identified in the greater Yellowstone area. We've got about 110 or so. Yellowstone has about a dozen of these. And these are trees that that we have recognized that may be resistant to this white pine blister rust. And those are the trees that we're protecting. Uh, we'll put cages on, uh, on that, we'll collect cones. Right now we're putting them through a nursery. We actually test them to see if they actually are resistant to this blister rust. Basically we grow these seedlings and throw this inoculum on there to spray them. And then if they come out okay, you say, oh, that's great. Well, those may be the trees of our future that we can sort of grow, we can propagate, we can propagate those seeds and the seedlings and maybe plant on the landscape. So I think those are the type of things that I think we can be looking at that. And planting of these resist resistant trees, to me, seems the most promising right now for trying to make white bark pine persistent in the future. And then, you know, 
it's interesting, again, we're managers and there are some things we can do as managers in a national park or national forest and there are things that are make it a little more difficult. And let me say this, you know, almost all of the white bark pine, because of its high elevation, occurs on federal land. Half of that occurs in either recommended or designated, uh, designated wilderness. And that sort of presents some management challenges as we look to the future of white bark pine and as we go forward towards protection and or restoration. Right now, the people that you saw in the video, these Forest Service people, they're great. They're, they're, we're finding plenty of opportunities to plant and restore white bark pine in non-wilderness areas but sooner or later we're going to probably have to address that issue uh, on that and it's sort of a to me it's sort of a, a, a bit of a paradox because obviously what we try to do in wilderness areas is we manage and we towards this uh, you know natural conditions but we also keep it untrammeled and that means we don't mess with it Sometimes I feel that the more we mess with things, the more it gets messed up. And uh, so, um, I th but on the other hand, the very important component of the Wilderness Act is that we enjoy the, the, these areas and their natural conditions. So if we have, in my opinion, human cause issues going on there, and this is the same thing for native cutthroat trout, maybe invasive weeds, we probably feel, I, at least I feel, that we have some compunction to at least look at management of those other areas. But it's a, real, it's a real balancing act as managers how we go forward as far as wilderness areas. And right now, I, I don't think that's that big of a deal because we have plenty of non-wilderness lands that we can be looking at, but sooner or later. So I just want to tell you what Yellowstone Park has been doing, you know, as far as white bark pine. And again, you know, we don't have civil culturalists. We're not planting. But what we are doing is, number one, we're participating in the greater Yellowstone area white bark pine management. Um, we participate in this GYCC, the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee. I think it's a very important committee. Uh, collection of managers throughout the greater Yellowstone area that come together every year or more than that to, 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 to help understand white bark pine. Uh, we have a monitoring program, the National Park Service, and we monitor white bark pine not only in the parks but in the greater Yellowstone area. We work together with the GYCC. We need to know what is going on now and in the future about this species. I think that monitoring is critical to us understanding this as managers. Um, we need to support the greater Yellowstone genetic conservation. And again, we're not planting trees, but we are providing uh, plus trees, cones. Uh, what our geneticist and Mary Frances, you probably saw in the video, is telling me that the Mount Washburn area looks especially resistant to this, uh, this white pine blister rust. That's, uh, so we may be a good provider for that genetic uh, material. We need to allow wildland fire do our, do its job. It's a natural disturbance on the landscape. I think it is important with that. With that said, we probably need to recognize those plus trees, these genetically unique areas that we may be looking at, uh, maybe protecting from wildland fire to some degree as we go through that whole wildland fire management or planning process as well. And then we need to allow the nutcrackers to do their job as well. Natural regeneration, and I do think that the greater Yellowstone area is fortunate right now that, that those nutcrackers seem to be here and they seem to be doing their job as well. There's been studies that have happened in Glacier Park, Western Montana, where all of a sudden those birds are gone. And when you lose that natural regeneration process, we will get a more cascading effect on that. And, and, and we need to keep an eye on these nutcrackers and make sure that they're, they have the opportunity to help us as we go forward uh, on this. And then we need to monitor. Keep that monitoring, keep measuring, keep understanding what we need to do for not only the status and the health of white rock pine, but also the restoration and protection that, that I talked about. We need to understand that that is producing positive re results for us as well. And then we also, and I'm going to talk for the park at least, and I will also say for the wilderness areas, is we need to be prepare ourselves that a more active restoration may be occurring in the future. I'm just trying to maybe push that needle a little bit on that. And I think this video said that. So where are we going? I love this, this little picture, you know, kind of stuff. With white bark pine, with the integrity of these high elevation uh, ecosystems on that, we need to understand that invasion, extinctions are 
an ongoing process. It's very dynamic, but things when some when it becomes a little more uh, because of us. And I always think of invasive species that we play that we played a hand in that. That happens a lot more rapidly than we may realize on that. We also need to know that climate change is out there. That it does bring that uncertainty in the future, and that we need to sort of keep an eye on that in light of of that type of uh, unknowns as well. You know. Federal policies, you know, does tell us that if we have, you know, a species that is, you know, in peril, is in decline, is even reaching towards, you know, maybe towards that listing, it is our job, it is our responsibility to try to manage that. I think of lake trout and cutthroat trout on Yellowstone Lake, you know, we've caught over 300,000 lake trout in Yellowstone Lake this year alone. Over a million since, you know, since we first discovered on that. You wonder if you're doing any good, but you know you can't stop. You know, you know that we have to give it our best shot. And I feel that's the same thing regarding whitebark pine on, on the landscape. And that native species, the whitebark pine, they do belong in the greater Yellowstone area. They do belong in our high elevation landscapes. I think that's really important for us to, uh, to recognize that. And then finally, this could not happen without the collaboration that has been occurred in the greater Yellowstone area. It was the, all the national forests, all the national parks, the interagency grizzly bear study team, the national biological system, and now including American forests as they go forward with this partnership on this. This brings me the, leaves me the most hopeful that we are working to, together on this and that, you know, through time that I think we can make, make sure that white bark pine does persist in the greater Yellowstone area. So, so that's my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if I have any time, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Yeah, I think we do have time, so uh, shoot. Yes. How does what you said relate to the white bark pine trees? I'm sorry, the, the limber pine. Tree. Oh, good question. How does all the things I talked about relate to limber pine? Limber pine is a five needle pine, not unlike a white bark pine. It's a lower elevation. You'll see it around here. All the things that occurs with limber pine, whether it's mountain pine beetle or white pine blister rust, does occur with limber pine as well. So limber pine is sort of the the, the, the poor cousin, I have another term, but I'll leave it at that, uh, that people don't, you know, sort of give them enough credit to, but also I think limber pine is a little more, is, is just as in peril as white bark pine. Also, but limber pine has a more broader range and distribution, you know, from so the, the forest in, in the Shoshone National Forest to the prairie out here, so that gives it a little more resilience, but it's going through a decline as well. Good question. Yes? Uh, there's two questions. One, are there uh, predators for the white bark pine beetle that could be introduced to encourage uh, you know, their disappearance? Or and secondly, are the, um, the chemicals that are being used, are those naturally derived from antigens that the pines are producing themselves? Or are there antigens that can be uh, provided to the pines? You know, if there's any predators of the mountain pine beetle, I really don't know of them of any significance. Obviously, so there's some uh, bird species, flickers, things like that, that probably take advantage uh, of, of those larvae or those seeds, but I don't think it makes a difference on a landscape scale. Um, so I would say the major predator of uh, mountain pine beetle is carbaryl. And carbaryl is a pesticide, and it's weird because you got to spray it up to about to the tree about this thing in diameter. You got to put a rain jacket on. It's awful stuff. And, uh, and but that is shown to be the most effective way to treat these trees as a prevention from uh, from mountain pine beetle. Uh, the other one you saw the picture of that little patch. That is called verbenone and that is a ferrome that they derived from the mountain pine beetle and basically what that patch says to these other beetles is sorry occupied go elsewhere and that's what protects that tree you can either do it as an individual tree and that is what we do do to protect those plus trees. I do put them on the limber pine trees around Mammoth. I consider that a historic landscape. So I'm trying to protect, you know, that area. So there's probably special unique areas. We, but they can also be put, you know, I can't remember the number, something like five trees every acre or something like that. So people can, you know, managers can, you know, protect stands with that as well. I, I wondered if the, uh, the plus trees, are they plus trees because of 
irritation, or is it because of some sort of antigen that they're producing that is enabling them to resist the, the beetles? You know, the resistance of white pine blister rust from, from, uh, um, from white bark pine does occur naturally. It's, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% or 5%, somewhere in that neighborhood. I don't know the mechanisms that make one tree resistant to, to another, but it does occur naturally. But those plus trees so do show that tendency. How you recognize a plus tree is if you go in an area that's pretty, hit pretty hard with blister rust, and it's beautiful and green and not doesn't seem to show the cankers and the fruiting bodies, that gives us that indication. But then we have to take it through the nursery, collect seed, take it through the nursery, and get it inoculated to really true determine if it is. This is what they've been doing with western white pine through the years. Western white pine, very high commercial value, have been studied, have been, you know, looked at for, for decades upon decades. White bark pine is relatively new as far as forestry and forest research goes, and it really has been the last, say, 20, 25 years, really because of its forage value to bears and other that has really become a little more, you know, studied and a little more researched. Yes. In a series that I produced in 2008 with NRDC, um, interviewed several scientists who, uh, who told us that actually the white bark pine did not evolve with the native beetle because they're so high up, the beetles never got up that high, and they actually don't produce, they, they, they shoot <coughs> out, um, uh, instead of sap, they're shooting out just pitch, just, you know, and so it, it sounds like to me and from your discussion today, there's not much you can do for huge stands as long as the climate is changing, pushing those beetles up the mountain. I didn't see anything in your laundry list that said you could do anything about the beetles, really, as long as the climate is. You know, when you have major infestations of mountain pine beetle, again, those seas of red, you're right. There's probably not much that a manager can do for that mountainside or that drainage as far as mountain pine beetle. Um, but I'm not sure if... I'm not sure if I would agree that mountain pine beetle and white bark pine has not evolved. Mountain pine beetle typically goes to the lower elevation pine species. We've seen some lodgepole uh, beetle, you know, lodgepole pine attacks in the 70s and 80s that were pretty spectacular uh, on that. We do not see it in the white bark pine that often because of the higher elevation and not quite as, uh, 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 you know, conducive to mountain pine beetles, but in the 1930s there was a major attack, uh, you know, in the greater Yellowstone area uh, that, again, you look at the, 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 the tree ring and all that kind of record, you'd be able to see, see that. What happened in the 30s, very drought conditions, but it went way up, but it went way down. It takes that 20 below two weeks, something like that, for those, for those, those infestations to really die down. And what we're, what we're seeing is we have a more recent attack. It's going into high elevation, you know, like it did in the 30s, but it didn't quite go down like other past patterns have shown. It's sort of sustained. It is dropping down a lot. Here's my fear when it comes to drought conditions and potential climate change is it never really drops all the way down. It kind of stays at some level and then it's ready to bounce back up given the right, you know, the right conditions. And that's what I fear for, 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 uh, for mountain pine beetle. Yes? Yeah, one of your slides had um, management options for the park. But the very last one, um, the very last bullet point, looked like a little fill in the door of potential if things got dire enough that the park would consider planting. Is that kind of what that last statement was about? Well, and that was my slide to the park managers <laughs> that we need to prepare for that, uh, that, that management option. And Yellowstone National Park probably falls in the same, uh, pos the same position as far as the Forest Service and wilderness lands. And, and most of Yellowstone's backcountry, you know, along its, away from its roads, away from its development, is recommended wilderness. We, by our policies, have to manage that, those areas as wilderness. So as, the, as managers do in the wilderness, Yellowstone Park's probably in that same refrain, so to speak, to go into active civil cultural management at this time. But sooner or later, 
54%, I think, you know, of those of white bark pine occurs on wilderness lands that if we do want the species to persist, and as we get to know more about the ecology of what's going on with white bark pine and more about maybe effective restoration measures, then I think we need to consider that option. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it.